Okay, so today we will do um, Unit 3 of Section 5. Um, we did 1 and 2 yesterday, and so we'll keep doing those throughout this week, uh, getting us ready for our NIMS test that will be on the 23rd. And um, so we're going to just cram in as much stuff as we can, um, just so that we know that we're ready for that. A lot of the questions that will be on that test won't necessarily be direct questions like what we're working off of, but um, it will kind of be a lot of general information. So every one, of, every one of these units that we go through from Section 5, we'll have a quiz after it. You just have to have those done Sunday night, 11.59. You're good to go. So don't need to do them today. If you want to, though, you're welcome to do them tonight. That way they're fresh in your mind. So like my 104s this morning as I pulled down, go ahead and do it while we're thinking about it. Talk about cutting rates, um, choosing the right cutting tools, work pieces and tools and the way that we mount them on there. And we'll look at also depth of cut, speed and feeds, and then calculating time. <clears throat> so when we're working off our part, remember tools on the center line, uh, our depth of cut is by the diameter um, that we're trying to calculate and then our feed per revolution uh, is what we're traveling down or away from the chuck typically towards the chuck this chart here tells us um, about um, how fast we should spin so depending on the, the type of material so um, most of what we've been, been cutting was um, non-ferrous materials and this is for anything from your um, really low carbon steels all the way up to your tool steels, stainless steels, cast irons, um, and then they'll tell you um, high speed steel, which is like your high speed steel part up tool, um, or carbide, which is like your carbide um, inserts. It'll tell you what the surface footage is there. And so then we've got a formula um, that you just plug these numbers in so that you can figure out how fast you should be spinning. For us, we've been just kind of traveling as fast as we can RPM-wise, and then I've been giving you some feed rates uh, to travel along. And so here is some general rules of thumb, fronting operations, depth of cut, um, anywhere from 50 thousandths to 250 thousandths, uh, feed rate of 10 thousandths to 40 thousandths per revolution. Uh, or inches per revolution, and then that'll give you, so roughing gives you that rougher surface finish. On our lathes, generally, if you pick a roughing feed rate of about 15, and then when you switch from A to B, it cuts it in half, and so that automatically kind of makes your finish feed rate. So rough at 15, finish at 7, rough at 20, finish at 10. So the slower you feed across the, the workpiece, the smoother the finish is going to give you, just the longer it's going to take to get across there. Sometimes surface finish matters, sometimes it doesn't. So um, here we are on our finishing operations, anywhere from 10 to 50 thousandths, um, and then feed rates of anywhere from 1 to 10 thousandths. 1 thousandths on a feed rate, the problem that you have with that is that you're not taking enough material, and it kind of just tears the material away from it rather than cutting it. So what we want, we actually want that insert to get up underneath the material so it'll create a good shift as it goes across it so it'll come off of there nice and smooth. So I try to not have a uh, finish cut anything less than really about 10 thousandths um, on, on most things. General lathe safety, um, just paying attention to some of our general safety um, things that we've talked about. Um, no loose hair, no hoodie strings coming down. Um, if you're wearing a hat, um, let the hat fall. You know, if it, if it is going to fall under there, don't try to grab it. You're never going to be quick enough to grab it. If something falls, uh, you're better to just step back, get out of the way, let it do its thing, hit the brake if you can, turn the spindle off if you can. Um, there's an instinct that people have if they see. So like, let's say you have a file sitting on the headstock, which you shouldn't, but let's just say you do, and it starts to work its way down into the headstock, so it wants to fall down onto the workpiece. A lot of times students will want to reach for it, 
Um, I would say rather than do that, hit the break, just stop the thing. Grab the file out and just move on after that. It's just way better to do those things. All right, looking at facing and OD turning operations. Um, so here we have um, just two real quick op, um, examples of face off and then turning towards the chuck. Uh, so it's tail stock, so it's going towards the chuck. Anytime you're facing off, generally we're not facing off like this. We're generally facing off like this with a tool that way. Um, on center, slightly below for all of our OD turning. Um, because if you're above center, you're going to get that. You guys have seen it already. You get that kind of torn look. You get a lot of heat, a lot of friction because it's not on the cutting edge. Cutting edge is actually above it, above that diameter, and it's rubbing that thing to death. And it just looks like total trash. So really, on center or slightly below is where you want to be for OD turning. Same thing for facing. When you come off, it's okay for the tool to slip slightly underneath the center of it. Uh, if it's at, if it's slightly above the center, pretty good chance that it might roll up, break the front of the insert off or whatever your cutting tool is, and then you end up with a problem. So on center, slightly below should be how you run for all of your external turning stuff. All of these tools that you see here, uh, on all these pictures in your book, um, they are what we call cemented carbide. So the carbide is silver soldered onto a piece of not as hard steel, so pretty mild steel. And even these, these are typically used in like boring heads on the mill. Different shape cutters to do different things, all cemented carbide. I would love to see us get away from those in the future, but we're using them right now. High speed steel, you guys have used high speed steel. Those are what you use for all of your shaping um, tools. And insertable tools, all various different sizes and shapes, um, all different kinds of makeup that you can use for that. You have your right hand tools. So somebody told me one time when I was trying to figure out what a right handed tool was versus a left handed tool, because when I look at them, I have a hard time understanding the difference of them. I was told that if, if you turn the tool to where it looks at you, the insert should be on your right hand side. Another way of looking at it would be um, what you're going to hold, if you were to reach out and grab this tool, you're going to grab the non-cutting side of the tool if it's a right-hand tool. Okay, so um, let me grab one of ours. So here is a handful of different tools that we have. So this is a right-handed tool. All three of these are right-handed tools. Actually, almost all of those are. Because when I look at them, if I reach out, that's my cutting edge. Or if it's facing away from me, when I reach out and grab it, it's on the non-cutting side. So whichever way works better for you to be able to remember it. And I'll give you this to pass around. So basically, a uh, right-hand tool points to the left, and the left-hand tool points to the left. It does. It goes what I feel like is the opposite way. So I can remember looking at the first time and going, I think you're saying it backwards. And he's like, no. He goes, everybody always says that, but this is how they go. Oh, yeah. What's that? What's this one? Neutral. Yeah, so that's a neutral profiler. So neutral profiler is right in the middle. Does a groove for like a shiv or a pulley or something like that. So yeah, your right-handed tool turns to the left. Your left-handed tool turns to the right when they face away from you. If they're facing towards you, then they do make sense. And then neutral tools can cut either direction. So could be used, a neutral tool could really, I guess a threading tool really could be a neutral tool. But really these neutral, a neutral profiler is probably one that you see more than anything out in the world. So the various sizes, shapes, designs of inserts, typically we want something with some negative clearance on the front. This one has positive clearance on the front side. So it can turn a shaft, but it just can't turn a shoulder on a shaft. Like it, it would eventually run into itself. And so 
that's positive clearance versus negative clearance. And so most of the stuff that we use has negative clearance in it. So this might be working for, if you were making a shaft all the way across something, this would be a good tool for that. Um, yeah, you should. This has negative relief underneath it. Positive relief would be really the wrong way. Usually somewhere between five to seven degrees is what you get clearance wise from there. Honestly, if your tool is set up on center or slightly below, you should be able to have no clearance underneath it. The shaft itself should make the clearance area for it. So sometimes we'll have tools that don't have any clearance underneath them. Sometimes it's the inserts held in at an angle. Sometimes it's the insert itself. If the insert has no angle on it, it'll be identified in the four letters or three numbers that are on the back side that identify the insert. Um, C and G432 would be one of them. Um, the C and M uh, G helps us to know um, it doesn't have any side relief or any clearance angle on it, so you can flip it upside down and use both sides of it. So it determines if you have an insert that's shaped like this, you can only index it along the top. If you have an insert that is straight down, you can insert it around it and then flip it over and insert it again or index it again. So you end up getting either possibly four, eight, or six sides of cutting edges on there. So I've got some inserts that I'll show you as well. So here are some various types of inserts anything from milling, turning, drilling, cutting anything that you can imagine. So you have your neutral, you have your positive, and you have your negative for your tools. And every one of them kind of plays a certain role, but there are definitely ones. We would rather probably stay in the neutral to negative, probably never on that positive uh, rate. I mean, depending on what it is, Operation-wise, I guess I should say that. Here's just some relief angles um, for cutting. Any more uh, on most of our cutting tools, the insert manufacturer already has the um, chip relief uh, angles already cut into it or molded into it, so we don't really have anything to do with that. So here is really kind of the map that helps us to understand what is happening with the insert. Now, I'll Try to pull it in to get it just a little bit better. Okay, so one of the ones I gave you as an example was a CNM G432. So we won't even really pay attention to any of these. Um, C tells us the, the shape of it. N, um, or whatever the letter might happen to be, uh, tells us what it is clearance angle. So if I have a CNMG, so it's at 80 degree, it has zero side clearance on it. C and M, then I find the tolerance class, and then G would be pull through it, chip or on both sides. This is in your book, it's kind of hard to see it from here. 432 tells us the inscribed circle tells us the thickness, and then tells us the cutting edge of it. 432 is um, inscribed circles, half inch maybe, um, and then thickness is um, three is uh, eight maybe, and then cutting edge is um, 432 would be a 30, roughly a 30 thousandths tool nose radius on it. Uh, but usually on the back of an insert, you just leave it there. Um, the back of an insert box will tell you what it is that that it that tell you that information some of this stuff is things we've seen before when you have your turning tool set up um, you want to try to to shorten this distance as much as possible same thing with our tool hanging out we are our cross letter compound hanging out we want to have our compound pulled back in as tight as it can be, our tool pulled back in as far as it can be. Set up like this, got this excessive overhang, you get vibration, kind of a diving board situation going on there. 
A um, couple methods of stopping our parts. And I think Matt might have asked me in the very beginning, do you have a stop as we're turning up against the face of this? Some blades do have that, a mechanical stop um, that goes on there. And so it's got like a pin and that pin reaches out to a, another pin or a, or a detent somewhere and pops it out of gear so that you can feed up to a shoulder continuously. So really you could set the cut into motion you could run to the bathroom and come back, and if it hit the shoulder, it stops because it has a, has a determined, predetermined area where it's gonna stop. Ours don't have that. They actually do have that, but it's a really, it's a really difficult mechanical stop that, that really, it's pretty rough on the lathe. Um, I ran a lathe before that had a tray, or it had a little piece of stock that ran across the bottom on the top of the tray had a pin that stuck up like this when it went across that pin and just kicked it out. So there's several different kinds of mechanical stops you can use. Here's just an indicator. So they preload when they want it to stop against the shoulder to zero. And then when you get to zero, it just stops. You, you stop it, okay? And then here's one that's got uh, either a digital readout or some type of an automatic stop that this is probably just digital readout, so you know you're feeding up to zero or you're feeding back to a negative one inch and a half. Um, or it could have a, an electronic digital stop in there to turn it off. Um, let's see. So a little bit of facing. Some turning. A lot of this stuff we've already gone over. So when you come up and do something square shoulder, you need to make sure you have clearance relief this way and relief this way because you want to you want to feed in on your finish pass, feed in and then feed out this way. That way you make a really nice square shoulder as you run across it. And again, most of our tools are insertable anymore, so we don't really have to worry so much about that. Um, if you're running a tool that has um, a radius in it, or if you need a radius in the corner. Typically our inserts have radiuses, some kind of radius in the corner, but if you have a bigger radius or a need for a bigger radius, you're gonna take the uh, high-speed steel and um, make your own radius for that. When you file, I know, I think John and I talked about this one time. Um, when if you're going to file on the lathe, like deeper an edge, you've got to go. You got to turn into a left-handed person. So you don't want to be leaning over the headstock with the file. Uh, there's really way too much opportunity for you to get hung up on something. Uh, I am left-handed by nature, so I just automatically run over here on this side. So you're going to have to really talk yourself into to kind of filing backwards on there. Um, it's really the only way you can do it in a really safe way. So he or she is over here on this side, not leaning over this, uh, because that's going to really put you in immediate danger. Um, when filing, nothing wrong filing on there. Um, just be gentle as it goes. You know, you're not trying to bear down so much that it could cause you to be in a potential dangerous situation. A lot of times, so here, this person is filing on the threads. Very common. You might kick it up at an angle, clean those threads up just a little bit. Sometimes as you thread it, it creates a little rolled over burr or edge. Might just clean off that, that uh, edge and then be ready to go. Um, here, you have some emery paper, and I think I've been pretty clear about this. Doing this is not okay. Um, even though it happens all the time, okay? So when you go out to a job, and, and I know even in the welding world, you still might go into a situation where you're, where you're like that. I mean, welding shops and machine shops go hand in hand all the time. There is a really, is a, is a natural tendency to grab that emery paper, pull back on it, polish that shaft. It's really easy to get a lot of pressure on it. What you don't want to have happen is that thing to grab and pull you in because you cannot react quick enough okay um so 
they have air files and, and some other situations where you can do that automatically where it's not, you're not putting yourself in danger. I would tell you if you are going to do something like this, you need to put that emery paper on top of the file, loosely hold it, file across it or um, sand across it. Um, really, if at all possible, you need to try and just machine the good surface finish that you need. You know, this is kind of this is kind of trying to make something that doesn't look so good look good. But I mean, it, it happens, and I don't want to say I don't want to say don't ever do this because I think that there are times that that you might end up doing it. So just be very very cautious. You just cannot do it here. All right, centering and center drilling. Uh, your center drills are different than spot drills, and your center drills have a 60 degree included angle on the end of them to match the center. So you want to make sure you have enough taper on there that the center can go in there and it doesn't bottom out in the hole, but it stops on the angle. So um, this is your correctly drilled hole for centering. Several different types of spot drills. Spot drills typically have a 45 degree angle or a 90 degree included angle. That is a chamfer. That is great for like you guys are on the mill right now, and that's perfect for there. So center drills primarily on the lathe, um, spot drills primarily on the mill. So if they kind of keep that distinction, that would be helpful. Um, drill on the lathe with you know whatever you got drill chuck or put it in the Jacobs taper. Uh, you could ream on there, any kind of hole work that you want to do. Boring is just like external turning. It's just on the inside. But you're going to just do the exact same things. Here's a couple of different examples of boring options. Um, these are really um, oftentimes used in like an offset boring head, but they will work for um, internal boring as well. Here's a couple of different other kind. Here would be what I would prefer you use. Be something like this. CMNT insert. Always watch for clearances as you're going. What you don't want to do is run into something. It's bad, bad mojo. Um, here's, and uh, I don't want to say it's common. A lot of people will tap holes like this um, with some type of center drill, pilot drill, something on the back, and then a tap handle. I would encourage you to power tap. I think it, using the tailstock, I think it's going to create a better thread as you do it. Um, this is really kind of going by hand doing it. Um, when you do that, a lot of times your threads get really stretched out, really worn down, really chewed up. So um, I would, even though the power tap might scare you a little bit, I would really encourage you to, to go ahead and just go for it. Um, here is a die situation. Same thing. Um, there's a tendency to, to take this, and I, I see this happen all the time. I, I saw it here not long ago. Um, where someone will take a die handle like this, they've got a die in there, they want to cut threads on the outside. One, I would say either use our, our tool that we have made here to cut your external threads on, or single point in. If you're going to do this, um, you, you can, you can keep it centered and then kind of do it by hand. Don't try and hold it and turn the spindle on. Um, you are not stronger than that spindle. That spindle, just, it doesn't have... It doesn't have bones to break or anything to, to give out, and it's just going to go, and it's a really good way to get hurt. And so there are better ways to cut threads than to do it like that. Um, form tools, we've done quite a bit on that. Grooving tools, pretty straightforward. Um, it's going to be a square cutting tool. It's going to do any kind of undercuts, any type of grooves, any type of parting would also fall into that area. Um, it's just some groove. We've done, you guys have gotten really good at knurling. Um, the only thing that we haven't really done knurling wise, we haven't done any straight knurling. Same process. Um, it's just instead of creating that cross hatch pattern, creates a straight, straight grooves that run across our straight lines. You're really, the only times you're going to use something like that is if you're going to press something in, um, it'll go in nice and straight and it won't want to spin inside there. So like they used to do valve guides and stuff like that a lot. Um, you don't see it that much anymore. But uh, so a medium neural is, is kind of standard and then and the same thing on a, a straight neural about medium is pretty standard. A couple different types of neuraling tools. 
This one squeezes down on top of the bottom of the shaft. This one pushes up against it, similar to ours. This one, it has like a, uh, it floats, and then a lot of times there'll be like a fine, a coarse, and a medium on it, so you can rotate over to which ones you want. There is knurling. You guys are knurling pros. So you've got that under control. That was loud. All right. Let's do... Let's save section four for tomorrow. <laughs>